Shalom, shalom everybody. Welcome back to another Pulse of Israel, Israel at War update. And yes, I'm here in a beautiful New York City area. Can't wait to get home, getting home, returning home soon to the Holy Land of Israel. Can't wait. In the meantime, I wanted to give you a short update and I'm going to start with a story. All right, it's a story that took place in the community of Kfar Aza, one of the Gaza border communities. Uh, mostly non-religious, could be a few religious families that live there. I don't know exactly how many, but this is one of those stories. Because one of the religious families, they're usually never in Kfar Aza for Shabbat. They usually go away for Shabbat because there aren't that many religious families in Kfar Aza. So they go away every Shabbat. The Shabbat of Simchat Torah, because it was a Shabbat here in, his, in the land of Israel, um... This family decided, again, October 7th, this family decided to stay in Kfar Aza for Shabbat Simchat Torah. Okay? The day of the massacre on Simchat Torah. The terrorists are running through the community of Kfar Aza and massacring, going into homes and killing people. This religious family saw the terrorists outside their home. They saw the terrorists look at a piece of paper and then move on and skip their house. Their lives were saved. Later on, this terrorist's body was found. Thank God he was killed. And the piece of paper that this terrorist held was found as well. And they found what was written on this note that that family, again, there were Gaza workers allowed to work in Israel who were spies and gave all the information to Hamas about all the, all the, where everyone lived, what the names of the families lived, how many kids were in each house, etc., etc. The piece of paper had written down that that religious family is never home on Shabbat. So the terrorists did not go into their home and their lives were spared. This is just one of the unbelievable, miraculous stories. Again, we're not going into saying who's saved, who's not saved. It has to do with what they did, what they didn't do. We're not going there. This is just an unbelievable, miraculous story. And we have to share the good stories as well. So that's one of those good stories. Now I want to move on to some other information. Again, we're in the ceasefire. Uh, we're in uh, little by little every night, 13 Jewish captives of children and elderly women so far for the first three nights have been released. Um, you have to understand, here in Israel there is such emotion for the release of these captives. Again, especially the children, but any one of them, they're getting their lives back. Please God, we should get all of them back. Again, emotions are very mixed because on the one hand, we're happy about each and every captive we, that ever is returned and hopefully will return to life and hopefully try to deal with the trauma they experienced as, as best as possible to continue to have as normal lives as possible. But still, we want to end this evil. And with each day, Hamas is brutally and e in an evil way manipulating the Israeli people by giving us just 10 at, 10 at a time and for they have 170 left, 10 at a time. They're trying to basically stop the war and remain in power. So we want to end their evil, and yet they're, they're deceptively using this captive, captive returning ceasefire situation to stop the war and get the world to, to, to stop Israel from going to war. So emotions are mixed, but we're very, very happy with each one of these um, captives who are released and coming back to life. One thing you have to pay attention to though, some of these children who are being returned to Israel, they don't know what happened to their families. Some of these children have both of their parents murdered. Some of these children have one of their parents murdered. And only when they return to Israel are they finding out what happened and who is left from their family. Some of their siblings might have been murdered. This is something you have to take into consideration because on the one hand, obviously, we're happy they're being returned. Understand this is a painful, 
painful reality for the Jewish people, for the land of Israel, and for these individual children returning to their lives. There are some happy stories of families being reunited. A father that his wife and two children returned. He was alone. That's a happy story. There are some others. We're happy for each and every one who's returned, but there are some very, very bitter, bitter, sad stories of these children returning to no parents or only one parent. Now I want to go into the politic a little more. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, Israel's Defense Minister were both in Gaza and they both, at separately at two different times, made clear that the war is not over until we eradicate Hamas, until Hamas is neutralized, that there is no threat from Gaza to Israel anymore. Okay, so we hope that they are not just saying those words. We hope that those words are held true, that they are saying it, that regardless of how Hamas succeeds in getting the world to pressure Israel to stop the war and to end our d ending the existence of this evil in Gaza to never be a threat. Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, Defense Minister Gallant have been clear. No, this war does not end until we end the threat from Gaza so that Israelis can live in peace knowing that will never happen again. They will never have the thought or the fear that anything of this magnitude of any terror can ever happen again from Gaza. That's the positive. Now, this morning, today, Elon Musk, right, the, 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 the high-tech tycoon who bought Twitter and it's now called X, he is now in Israel. He was just on a tour of the southern communities. I think he was in Be'iri or maybe one of the other communities with the Prime Minister Netanyahu. And Prime Minister Netanyahu said the following, and this I'm not happy to hear that the Prime Minister said. I don't know if he means it or he's just saying it again, the politician, but he said, we will rebuild Gaza and the Gazans will be re-educated just as the Germans and the Japanese were re-educated by the Western world after World War II, right? Denazified. So he's trying to say that Gaza will be rebuilt, Israel will support the rebuilding of Gaza for Gazans, and they will be de-Islamified basically, right? Because <laughs> right? that's what it is. Islam and the Islam of Hamas and the Islam that is about destroying Israel and the Jewish people and the infidel is strong in our midst, okay? Now, I, I'm so upset that he said this. I really hope he just said it in order to make the world happy because understand what he said is impossible. First of all, who's going to pay for the rebuilding of Gaza for Gazans? Israel? You expect Israel to put money to rebuild Gaza? That's number one. No way Israelis don't want to put money to rebuild Gaza. That's number one. Number two, even if, even if there is a plan to re-educate these Gazans, understand that it is impossible. All right? I want, I, and it's not about the education in the Gaza Strip. Understand the United Nations responsible for education. UNRWA. UNRWA is Hamas. UNRWA. With your funding, U.S. taxpayer money, European taxpayer money, it teaches the children in Gaza and Judea and Samaria to kill Jews. It's, and I tell this you all the time, and just go to palwatch.org or go to David Bedin's videos on UNRWA to show the, the educational system. This is international funding. United States politicians know this. Biden knows this. European politicians know it. They all know it. They know it for years. International funding, international programs, teaching children to kill Jews. But it gets worse than that. It's, in, it's inherent in the international community that these Palestinian Arabs, who are really just regular Arab Muslims in the fake cause called Palestine, it's all about destroying the Jewish state of Israel with international support and international funding. Do you know there are two refugee organizations by the international community, the United Nations? There is one, UNHRC, I think it is, which is refugees from all over the world. And for them, their mandate is to resettle refugees. And then there's a second one, UNRWA, which is sp specifically only dealing with Arabs, refugees from the Israel situation, refugees from 1948, refugees from 1967. And their mandate is that they perpetuate the refugee situation, right? It's not resettling them. It's about making sure they get to resettle here in the land of Israel. 
and uh, even a child, a, a grandchild, a great-grandchild, great-great-great-grandchild, they are still considered refugees. No other refugee in the world is considered a refugee after the parents or, or the person that, that, that was the refugee from his, from, from his place. Only the Arabs called Palestinian Arabs from the Israel conflict with the Arab Muslim world. Does the refugee status continue, 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 continue? It's insane. So there, it's impossible for Netanyahu to think that the world would help re-educate Gazans or Arab Muslims in Judea and Samaria to not want to kill Jews. The whole UNRWA was set up as a, as a separate refugee organization specifically to be a thorn in the side and bring about the destruction of the Jewish state of Israel. And that is supported by the world. With international funding, your taxpayer money, U.S. taxpayer money, and European taxpayer money. So to hear Netanyahu spew the idiocy that oh, they will be re-educated, so they can re so they can, they can live there again, and then Jews won't feel threatened, that is a pipe dream. It is impossible. The international community, by supporting UNRWA, by supporting U.S. taxpayer money, European taxpayer money, United Nations money, being given to educate for years these Arab Muslim children in Gaza and Judea and Samaria to kill Jews, he is living in a pipe dream to think that that's going to change. Because Hamas is basically supported by the international community. UNRWA is Hamas. Iran is Hamas. Qatar is Hamas. They all give money to Hamas and to Hezbollah. The world allows them to have that money to give to Hamas and Hezbollah. I'm sorry, everybody. This conflict exists because the world allows it to exist. And Israel, because of our geopolitical challenges, doesn't have the guts to stand up to the world and say, you guys are funding our murder. You guys are funding the biggest genocide ever, the biggest anti-Semitic movement in all of history. U.S. taxpayer money, European taxpayer money. You are funding the killing of Jews. So you talk about anti-Semitism and fighting anti-Semitism. You, U.S. President Joe Biden, and you, Western leaders of European countries or Western countries, you can't say you're fighting anti-Semitism if you're giving money to UNRWA that teaches children to kill Jews and they grow up and they turn into massacres and barbarians. That's U.S. taxpayer money and European taxpayer money, Australian taxpayer money, Canadian taxpayer money, British taxpayer money, all with the knowledge of Western leaders funding anti-Semitism, the biggest anti-Semitic movement ever. So no Prime Minister Netanyahu. Don't you dare go in my name, in the name of the Jewish people, and say that we're going to rebuild for Gaza, for the Gazans, and re-educate them like the Western world re-educated Germans and Japanese after World War II. It's impossible. You can't re-educate Muslims against their Muslim religion, against the Quran. You can't, and especially if the world supports it. That's the situation, and with it all, we're going to win. And again, I am sorry that this is weak leadership from Netanyahu. I wish we could have a leader saying, guys, the only moral solution to Gaza to ensure there is never a threat again from the Arab Muslims in our midst is that for these Arab Muslims to live elsewhere. Because so long as they have any political power, they will use that power. And whether a group called Hamas or Islamic Jihad or Guns and Roses or Roses and Roses comes to exist and want power within that Arab Muslim culture, they will educate their children to kill Jews and destroy the Jewish state of Israel. That's the reality. So the only way we ensure there is no threat ever again to the Jewish people in this Jewish state of Israel is that these Arab Muslims move elsewhere. That's the solution. All right, everyone. Signing off. From New York City, I can't wait to be home in the ancestral, eternal homeland of the Jewish people. If you are not yet a subscriber to my Pulse of Israel videos, go to PulseofIsrael.com and click to subscribe. And if you like this video and you want to help me get it seen by many more people, click on the donate button every once in a while on PulseofIsrael.com to help us get these and other videos seen by many more people. Shalom. We're going to get out of this despite our weak leadership. Like I always tell you, everybody. It's up to the Jewish people and our faith in the one above. We will win. We are winning. We will win despite our weak leadership that is not willing to say what is necessary. Signing off. Shalom. Pulse of Israel. Frontline videos from the Holy Land. Support our work by donating today.